rock star Alice Cooper. Excellent. Jackie Charlton. Jackie Charlton. Ooh. Famous football. Oh, we've got anyone? Yeah? Ross Kemp from EastEnders and... Bob Champion, Aldeniti, yes, fantastic. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Freddie Flintoff, Susie Quattro, anybody else? Yep. Lorraine Crosby. Fabulous. Right, we're really getting down the list here, aren't we? Neil Buchanan from Rotterdam. Anne and, and Cliff Richard. Was it? Was, I was going to say, that sounds like a really random gathering. Oh, dear. Um, I just want to tell you, I, I did meet somebody, um, well, he was famous to me. Um, he was somebody I'd been uh, reading a lot of his work. I'd spent nine years writing on a project, um, and a lot of the stuff that I based my stuff on was his, his work. And my friend uh, invited him to come and give a lecture and then introduced us. And I stood there in front of him and he said, hello, and who are you? And I told him my name and I said, and, and he said, and what do you do? And I just went, <laughs> And so I met somebody who I thought was really famous and completely froze and made a total mess of it. It was, a, it was an awesome encounter, but... I didn't handle it terribly well. One of my favourite stories of an awesome encounter is, involves the late Queen. I don't know if you've heard this, um, but it's when the Queen came across some American hikers. You might have heard this one. The story is told by her driver and bodyguard, Richard Griffin. Um, and he said they were walking in the grounds of Balmoral Castle, which is her holiday home in Scotland, and these two American hikers came towards them. And the Queen would always stop and say hello. Um, and it was clear from the moment that they first stopped that they hadn't recognised the Queen, who often, you know, had a headscarf on and she was in a wax jacket. And, um, and, and yeah, and so... Uh, Richard Griffin says, um, one of the Americans began telling the Queen where they came from and said, oh, and where do you live? And she said, well, I live in London, but I've got a holiday home just over the hills over there. Uh, and, and then they said, well, how long have you been coming up here? And the Queen said to the Americans, well, I've been coming up here for about 80 years now. And they said, goodness, have you ever met the Queen? <laughs> And liking a joke, the Queen says, well, I haven't, but Dick here meets her regularly, replied, you know, talking about her, her bodyguard who was there. And so the, the hiker turns to the bodyguard and says, you've met the Queen. Um, what's she like? And knowing that the Queen liked a joke, her bodyguard says, well, she can be very cantankerous sometimes, but she's got a nice sense of humour. Then the American put his hand on the shoulder of the Queen and said, could you take a photograph of us with him? <laughs> so the Queen took a photo, and then uh, the bodyguard took a photo of the Queen with this couple. Um, and so they went home with these photographs. Um, the Queen waves goodbye, and her bodyguard waves goodbye, and, and off they go over the hill. And the Queen said... I'd love to be a fly on the wall when he shows those photographs to his friends in America. <laughs> Hopefully somebody will tell them who I am. <laughs> Sometimes amazing encounters can have a deep and lasting impression on us. Um, and they can change your life forever. And I'm just going to read to you of one encounter that did just that. It's from Luke's Gospel. If you've got a Bible and you want to follow along, it's from Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. What an amazing passage. There's so much going on there. And I guess uh, we hear it sort of every Christmas time. um, And it can wash over us. But I want to look at three things that we, we can pull out of that passage in this encounter. And then maybe look a little about what it tells us about God. And about how we might respond to that. We all right with that? Excellent. Okay, well, the first thing, um, in this amazing encounter, when the angel appears, we hear greetings, you who are highly favored, and these words, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. It was God's word to Mary through the angel, and it's God's word to us today. The Lord is with you. What an amazing message. Because not only was that message that the angel gave, it's the name that was to be given to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And how many people living in concert in the the Northeast and in our families and our friends groups don't know that God is with them? feel that God is somewhere, maybe out there, that God is somewhere distant and far away, or think that because of the life that they've led, God couldn't possibly want to be anywhere near them. One of the great gifts of the Methodist Church is that after a number of years' service, they give you a sabbatical, um, which is a bit of time away from ministry. And I had a sabbatical, and I got to um, go for a long walk in Spain, Um, I walked what's called the Pilgrim Trail to Santiago. If you've ever watched the film um, with uh, Martin Sheen, it's a road that a load of people uh, walk for all sorts of different reasons. Don't have to be religious reasons. Some people do it for the adventure. Some people do it for the challenge. Some people do it to process grief. Um, And... As I walked along that road, I met people from all sorts of countries and backgrounds and situations. And we talk about life and we talk about things that happen to us in life. And at some point, the question would come, so what do you do? Now, early on in the walk, I'd say, well, I'm I'm a minister, I'm a church leader. And what would happen is people would absolutely clam up And a lot of that, they were like, oh, what have I told you? And they ran through in their heads all the stuff that we talked about before because they said they were just terrified that I, on behalf of the church, would judge them. They were out there seeking for something. They were out there um, wanting an encounter with something that would change their lives. But they were terrified that God wouldn't want to be anywhere near them or that God would judge them. And what we have is a message of salvation, of a God of love and grace, who comes to set us free from all that we've done, from all that we've messed up, from all that we regret. When the angel announces to Mary that she's going to bear a savior, he will be a king. He will be a compassionate king. A king who dies to set his people free. And so, when the Lord is with us, 
That's good news, not terrifying news. When the angel said, the Lord is with you, that's not to judge her or make her feel scared or terrified. It reminded me of when I was a kid and I learned to ride a bike. Um, and I started off with stabilizers. And then when my dad thought I'd probably done enough to, to have my stabilizers removed, off they went. Uh, but we went to the school playground where it was all empty and I could fall off as many times as I liked. And he held onto the back of the saddle. I don't know if anybody's ever done this with, with a child. And so he kept the bike upright while I pedaled as fast as my legs would go. And he'd be like, it's all right. I'm with you. I've got you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And as I got more and more confident, um, he held on lighter and lighter because he knew that's what I needed. But he'd keep going. I'm with you. I'm with you. And even when he let me pedal on my own, he was running alongside. So when I kind of keeled over, he caught me. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then even when I could ride my bike on my own, he even got his own bike done up so he could cycle with me. And he didn't need to say it anymore. In my head, there was a little voice. It's all right. I'm with you. I'm with you. And maybe this morning you're here and you need to hear just those simple words. The Lord is with you. I remember during the pandemic when they released the blessing. He is with you. He is for you. And just what a comfort and a strength and a powerful thing it was to know the Lord is with you. But Mary was tr greatly troubled. Sometimes knowing that the Lord with, is with us doesn't stop us being greatly troubled. In fact, sometimes we need to know the Lord is with us because we're greatly troubled. There is a lot going on in the world which is wrong and bad and difficult and distressing and frightening and terrifying. And Mary receives this news and is troubled. But the angel says to her, do not be afraid. It's interesting that it goes that way around, isn't it? It's not, do not be afraid, the Lord is with you. It's that the Lord is with you. God always goes before us in his grace and his power. God is always there with us. And therefore, we need not be afraid. Fear is a difficult thing. Fear is a very prevalent thing, I think, at the moment. A lot of people are deeply fearful for the future, for the present. Anxiety among young people in our society has risen exponentially. And fear grips in a way that makes us not think straight, not act straight, really struggle just to do basic things. Apparently, do not be afraid or do not fear appears over 360 times in the Bible. Some said it's 365, 366. That's enough for every day of the year. Do not be afraid. And on so many occasions in Scripture where God encounters people, the first words are, do not be afraid. Be bold and courageous. Take heart. Do not fear. I wonder why that is. Because Mary is confronted by an angel. The Greek angelos means messenger. And the message from God is, don't be afraid. But it's amazing, isn't it? Because it's the kind of message that is enough to induce deep fear in anybody. Here you go, Mary. You're going to have a baby. I know it sounds impossible, but you're going to find yourself pregnant in a village full of people who might gossip, in a culture where to be an unmarried mother is a terrible thing and you could possibly get stoned to death, your only explanation will be this is God's baby. And that's just before the birth. Because you'll have to take a long and difficult journey and give birth in a place where possibly 
you, you don't know the people who are familiar to you. And then you'll have to flee as a refugee to a completely different country. And then once your child has survived growing up in a different culture, then you'll bring him back and settle down. And then eventually he will, he will take up public ministry and people will flock to him and love him and adore him and hate him and reject him and whip him and scorn him and crucify him and you will watch him die on a cross. But don't be afraid, Mary. We often sing the song, Mary, do you know? Um, and it always made me think, if Mary had known everything that was going to be entailed, would she have said yes when the angel came? But she would have known some of the Old Testament prophecies. She would have known that a Messiah would come. But the angel says, do not be afraid. And in, in this slide, I did very small type for, do not, be a <laughs> do not be afraid despite what it looks like in front of you. Because often we need to be told not to be afraid because there are things to be, you know, faced, challenges, difficulties. But the angel, the messenger says, don't, don't be afraid. And then tells her all about the saviour that she will bear. And she has questions. She has practical questions. How is this going to happen? Because I'm a virgin. And the angel gives an explanation which comes to pass. But then, having been told that the Lord is with her and not to be afraid, we get to the deeper reason. Verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. Despite what it looks like in front of you, on paper, a young unmarried woman in a village in obscurity, bearing a child, is not the world's greatest strategy for saving the world. If we had to make a plan to sort out the world, to bring love and reconciliation and restoration, it's very tempting, isn't it, to go to the seat of power. You just look at Donald Trump emerging into his new presidency and all the invites that are going to Mar-a-Lago, that you invite the tech giants, you invite the world leaders, you build alliances, that's how power works. Yet for God, nothing is impossible. And God starts with the small and the obscure and the humble and the powerless because nothing is impossible with God. That to break the power of sin, to change the world, to begin the church that has changed society over 2,000 years, this is where God starts. Nothing is impossible with God. When I was 10 years old, I was asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. I confidently replied that I wanted to be a housewife, a vicar, or a professional footballer. Uh, what you need to know for the backstory of this is that I grew up in the Church of England, and at the time, they didn't ordain women to be church leaders. The only vicars I'd ever seen were men, and yet God sowed a seed somewhere in my heart that what was impossible could, in God's time and in God's way, become possible. I wanted to be a housewife because that's what my mum was, raising us, teaching Sunday school, running a lunch club for the elderly, a playgroup for toddlers, and she is still one of my greatest inspirations for what a disciple of Jesus looks like. That nothing is impossible because the transformational work of working with people, boots on the ground, sharing the love of Jesus in the ordinary things of life, and that changes the world. As for being a professional footballer, I'm still waiting for Everton to give me a call. And the way things are going this season, I might be in with a chance. 
But if you'd asked my 11-year-old self what was possible and what wasn't, somewhere in my heart, it looked very different to what was on paper and reality. And maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, do you know what? What I dream of, what I hope for, that's impossible. I sense God's leading me to do this. I sense God's prompting me to do that. I sense God's calling me to this thing. And yet, it's impossible. And yet, nothing will be impossible with God. And so what happens here? We get to this amazing response from Mary. Mary's response just blows me away. Having heard all this that the angel tells her, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. Mary says yes. In spite of the fear, in spite of the impossibility, God is with her. And somehow she says, yes. Just to take a couple of moments to go through what kind of a God Mary puts her trust in. Um, because we get this song later on, the Magnificat. And this is from verses 46 onward. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down the rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he's sent empty away. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary explodes in this cacophony of praise about who God is, who she's encountered in this amazing encounter. God, my saviour. She rejoices in God, my saviour, the one who comes to save her. And not just save her, but to save us. He's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. This is a God who works through ordinary people. Isn't that amazing? That God goes for Mary, goes for you and for me to change the world. The mighty one has done great things. It's God who does the great things. For us, to us, through us, in us. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Those who think that they've got it all together, got it all sorted, and tell the rest of us how they've got it all sorted. Mary says, do you know what? God scattered them. And the ones he's exalted are the humble and the meek. He's brought rulers down from their thrones and lifts up the humble. And he fills the hungry with good. Are you hungry for God? Are you hungry for the things of God? Because Mary testifies that he's the God who fills the hungry with good things. But the rich he sends away empty. Mary has found that that's the kind of God who has called her and who is living within her. And so I guess for the rest of us, that leaves the questions of how we respond. How do we respond to a God who is with us? We find out later that the child to be born, Emmanuel, comes and in John's words, um, I love the the message translation of John uh, chapter 1, where it talks about the word being incarnate. In the message version, it basically says God comes and moves into the neighborhood. Jesus comes and dwells with us, moves into the neighborhood of our lives and our hearts and our homes and our families. Jesus comes to be with us. 
God with us. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. Despite what it looks like in the world around us, in our personal circumstances, in the things that we face, do not be afraid because nothing is impossible with God because God is the kind of God who raises up the humble, who doesn't work on the world's terms of power, but who comes to be incarnate, born in a baby, in an outhouse, to live and to die, to know what it is to be human like us. Jesus who walked the dusty streets and met people who loved him and adored him and people who hated and rejected him, people who misunderstood him and still he loved them and healed them. Jesus, who went through death so that we can know life after this earthly life, that there is hope and eternity with God and love everlasting. Some encounters really can change our lives forever. And my prayer this morning is that you will encounter the living God, not just in the story of Mary, far, far away, but here and now in this room, that whatever you need to encounter God this morning, he will reach you and touch you in that place and that moment. And I'm I'm aware that in a room like this, there may be people who have never, ever said yes to Jesus for the very first time. So I'm going to give you the opportunity for that. That if tonight, this morning, if you've recognized that God is calling you by name and saying, the Lord is with you, God is here, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the past. It can have no hold on you because the forgiveness of Jesus is there for all who accept it. Don't be afraid for the future, for God promises to be with us and nothing is impossible with him. Then I invite you to respond as we pray together. just going to give you a couple of seconds to prepare your hearts and just see if God is prompting you this morning to respond. If you want to pray with me, if you want to say these words aloud. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that you are a God of love who came in Jesus Christ, your Son, to give your life for the world, to free us from our sins. to wipe away the past and to bring us to new life. I confess before you now all that has not been right in your sight. Through Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. and put my trust in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may follow you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.